Hi, I'm Jackie Stapleton and welcome to Atoll TV. In this video, I'm going to cover clause 9.3 management review. I'm going to break this clause down and turn it into something you can all understand. You'll then be able to apply this to your own organization systems and understand what the requirements will look like for you. No more guessing. Keep on watching as I can show you just how easy this is. Okay, let's get started. This clause starts off with the statement of, top management shall review the organization's environmental management system at planned intervals to ensure its continuing suitability adequacy and effectiveness. A couple of areas stand out here for me and these are top management and planned intervals. So let's go through them both now. Top management are the ones who are reviewing the environmental management system. This is the person or people who direct and control an organisation, the decision makers I always say. While top management can delegate responsibility and authority to others as described in Clause 5.3, they still need to review what is going on in the system. As Clause 5.1 states, top management is to take accountability for the effectiveness of the environmental management system. Therefore, this includes being involved in the review of the system. Then the second phrase that stands out to me is planned intervals. These reviews by top management are to be conducted at planned intervals. So what exactly are planned intervals and how often are they? Well, this depends on risk. Obviously, the higher risk of any actions or impacts to the environmental management system, the more often these planned intervals are. I often see that with newly implemented environmental management systems, the planned intervals for management review are more often. This is because it is a new system. There are still a lot of changes and possibly more work to be done to get the system firstly up and running and then to maintain it and address any gaps. Once a system has matured and it has been through several internal and external audits with minimal findings, then these planned intervals could be further apart. The timeframes I see with my clients are anywhere between monthly, quarterly, or even annually. I also have clients that determine the next management review, that is the next planned interval, at the conclusion of the current review. They base the next review on what actions there are and the risk of any areas discussed. So if they identified a high risk area that needed immediate action, they may decide to review again in a shorter time frame. Or if the last review was fairly uneventful, then they may decide to push it out for a few months. This is still meeting the requirement of planned intervals. We can now move on to the next section of the clause where it states that the management review shall include consideration of A, the status of actions from previous management reviews and B, changes in one, external and internal issues that are relevant to the environmental management system, two, the needs and expectations of interested parties, including compliance obligations, Three, it's significant environmental aspects. Four, risks and opportunities. This means that each management review is not a single or silo event. Previous review actions must feed into the next review. It's an ongoing process. And of course, if there have been any changes that influence the business and therefore the environmental management system, this is the place to bring them up. These changes could be customer, supplier or community requirements, workers, legislation, additional or changed environmental aspects identified. Anything that you identified as part of clause four context way back at the beginning of the standard. 
Then this clause moves on to list quite a few other areas that need to be taken into consideration, including C, the extent to which environmental objectives have been achieved. D, information on the organization's environmental performance, including trends in one, non-conformities and corrective actions, two, monitoring and measurement results, three, fulfillment of its compliance obligations, four, audit results. Each of these requirements can be referred back to their own clauses within ISO 14001. By understanding each of these requirements from their own clause will help you to review and determine the information and trends, positive or negative. To help you out, I will share the relevant clauses that I recommend you check out. So one, environmental objectives is clause 6.2. Two, non-conformities and corrective actions are addressed in clause 10.2, non-conformity and corrective action. Three, monitoring and measurement results can be tracked back to clause 9.1, monitoring, measurement, analysis and evaluation. Four, fulfillment of compliance obligations goes back to what you identified in clause 613, compliance obligations. And five, audit results are generated in clause 9.2, internal audit, where it provides great detail on the requirements, processes and outputs leading to these audit results. There are now just three more considerations for this subclause, which are E, adequacy of resources, F, relevant communication from interested parties, including complaints, G, opportunities for improvement. Top management need to also review whether there are sufficient resources to maintain and improve the performance of the environmental management system. Resources can be people, equipment, hardware, software, tools and communication requirements. To assist in understanding this, refer to clause 7.2, competence. And then speaking also of communication requirements, if you refer back to clause 7.4, communication, you will have determined communication requirements based on the needs and expectations of interested parties understood in clause 4.2. And then the final input is to consider opportunities for improvement. There is also clause 10, improvement. However, as far as I'm concerned, each clause requirement throughout ISO 14001 offers opportunities for improvement. You can see that all of these areas for input into management review come from an existing clause within the standard, which makes sense, of course. We are reviewing the system. The system has been developed from the standards clause requirements. This is one of the final loops in the process of review. So by understanding all of those other clauses that I've pointed you to, then you will understand what or how to review the outputs. The final section of this clause is about outputs of the management review, where it states that the outputs of the management review shall include conclusions on the continuing suitability, adequacy, and effectiveness of the environmental management system, decisions related to continual improvement, decisions related to any need for changes to the environmental management system, including resources, actions if needed when environmental objectives have not been achieved, opportunities to improve integration of the environmental management system with other business processes if needed, any implications for the strategic direction of the organization. This simply means that now that all of the inputs for consideration into the management review have actually been reviewed, there should be some outputs to show for it. This simply means that now that all of the inputs for consideration into the management review have actually been reviewed, there should be some outputs to show for it. 
The outputs of the management review involve the deliberate evaluation of the environmental management system to ensure it remains suitable, adequate and effective. This involves assessing whether the current methods for managing environmental impacts remain effective. It also includes making decisions about continual improvement, identifying new strategies or practices to enhance the environmental management system. Additionally, the clause covers the need to consider changes to the EMS, possibly requiring more resources such as funding, personnel or equipment. It's important to have a plan for situations where environmental objectives are not met, which means determining what actions to take in response. Another key aspect is the integration of the EMS with other business processes, ensuring that environmental responsibility is woven into all aspects of the organization's operations. Finally, the review must consider how all these factors influence the strategic direction of the organization, aligning environmental management with the company's overall goals and vision. This approach ensures that the company not only complies with environmental standards, but also actively works towards improving its environmental impact in alignment with its business objectives. Of course, this isn't the first place that the environmental management system has been brought up to align with the strategic direction of the business. This was first raised in Clause 5.1, Leadership and Commitment, so it shouldn't be a surprise here for review. Then most importantly, the final sentence of this clause states that the organisation shall retain documented information as evidence of the results of management reviews. Brilliant! This means that everything that was reviewed, discussed and resulted in actions should be recorded, written down, typed up, whatever this might look like for you. There needs to be evidence that this review was conducted. The most common method of evidence or recording I see for this are meeting minutes. You could actually do up a meeting agenda and include all of those input requirements from the first section of this clause and then record the outcomes and actions to produce meeting minutes. Now, I do want to make clear that nowhere in this clause does it state that this management review is a meeting. Top management can review any of these inputs in any way relevant to them or the business. All I'm saying is that in most situations that I come across, Management review is normally some sort of meeting with meeting minutes as the evidence. Well, I think I've talked this one through enough for now. Thank you so much for joining me. Clearly, you are truly dedicated to learning more about ISO standards. I love having you learn with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Order to Training Online is your one-stop shop for professional training. If you're interested in mastering even more of this standard, head over to our website and enroll in one of our courses. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to Atoll TV and drop a comment or question below. Your career transformation starts with a single click, so join me in making the world a better place. <music>